Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen A survey published in September 2021 led by Bath University in the UK found that of the 10,000 youth ages 16 to 25, three quarters feel the future was frightening and over half feel humanity is doomed. And one of the major causes of all this fear and anxiety is climate change. We hear many news headlines warning us of extreme weather, melting ice caps, rising sea levels, and even several countdown clocks to the extinction of humanity if we don't act now. But is this fear founded? We hear that CO2 levels are rising. But what does that mean? Is that a bad thing? Should we be concerned about the melting ice caps and its impact on sea levels? Is the Earth's temperature actually rising? Is there an actual consensus on the facts of this issue? Well, today we're going to discuss climate change, specifically the impact of CO2 on our environment. And joining me now to offer his counterpoint is Gregory Wrightstone, a geologist with over 40 years of research experience, executive director of the CO2 Coalition, and author of this book, Inconvenient Facts, The Science Al Gore Doesn't Want You to Know. Gregory, thank you for joining me today. Uh, interesting book title. I suppose this is a response. I know it's a few years old, but a response to, to Al Gore's uh, The Inconvenient Truth. Is that correct? Yeah. If, if I was doing it today, I might be the response to Greta Thunberg, but because uh, uh, we haven't heard much from Al lately, and I'm okay with that. He's probably in one of his uh, oceanside mansions that he's warning us all not to get near or, or traveling on one of his private jets that he's warning us not to do. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's dive right in. So, why did you write this book? Well, as a geologist, I knew that some of what we were being told about climate change was just incorrect. In particular, what jumped out at me was this claim of ocean acidification. I knew as a geologist that during times when CO two levels on Earth were five and six, and seven times as high as what they are today, the oceans never acidified. They're not going to now. I suspect that other things were wrong. So. The book was really the result of my own personal search for the climate change truth. And I didn't trust anybody when I first got into this. I said, I want to go back and look at the base data and what's it telling me. And frankly, uh, Tony, what I, what I found, uh, frankly, shocked me and angered me. I found that in situation and claim after claim, the science of facts and the data did not support these claims of a climate crisis, of tragedy, of man-made driven catastrophe. It's just not ha happening. And what I found and what the scientists here at the CO2 Coalition support is this notion that modest warming combined with increasing CO2 or in actuality leading to the Earth's ecosystems thriving and prospering and humanity's benefiting from this combination of warming and more CO2. Where we can, you can just go by well, almost every metric we look at. Uh, Earth's ecosystems are, are improving and thriving. Some of our viewers might say, okay, um, you know, we we hear frequently in, in the media headlines, um, on social media throughout, uh, from, from so-called experts uh, who are in, in the scientific uh, realm of, of the environment, and they do research in that regard, that, you know, climate ch change is, is happening and that we should be concerned about these things. So where did you get your research from? How did you go about doing research for this book? Well, I get, I get much of the same data from, these are government sources, NASA, NOAA from the United States, but that's worldwide data. Uh, the, I'm, I'm an expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There's a lot of good science in that. In that. Uh, so these are peer-reviewed studies or government publications. I got my data right. I went right to the base, the base sources and got good basic data. Uh, the book has received criticism, but no one's been able to point and say he's wrong on this. What they're saying is I, my conclusions are wrong, not the data that I use. Okay, uh, very good. I, I guess I have to get my mind right. Well, well, I mean, I, the one thing I, I enjoyed um, when I was going through your book is that there were so many tables and charts really demonstrating visually um, how things have changed or not so much have changed in the past uh, centuries, even um, or several few hundred years. Um, Okay, so let's talk about CO2. Um, well, so first of all, can you explain, we only have 30 seconds to the commercial break, so we'll do the deep dive in just a moment. But what is CO2? Can you explain that to us, you layman viewers? Yeah, carbon dioxide. It's, it's, the, uh, it's being claimed to be the demon molecule. We call it the miracle molecule. It's, the, the, it's a very basic molecule. It's a building block of all life on Earth. 
And it's with photosynthesis, of course, you need sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is is really at the bottom of it. It's plant food. Okay, uh, excellent. We we're gonna we're gonna pick this up in just a few moments. Welcome back to Counterpoint. Joining me now is Gregory Wrightstone. And we're unpacking climate change and specifically purported benefits of CO2, which we've heard contrary to that for the last number of years. So um, let's unpack that, Gregory. Uh, we frequently, as I've said here, that CO2, carbon dioxide, is harmful to the environment, that it increases climate change. Yet you suggest, again, in your book here, that uh, we are, in fact, benefiting from an increased CO2. And that sounds like a radical concept. So could you please explain? Well, the easiest thing to point to is, is really is the, what we call the greening of the earth. Vegetation, again, we just talked about photosynthesis requiring CO2. So the more CO2, actually, the better. Uh, the plants and the crops that we rely on for our, our food, these evolved at times when CO2 levels were four and five times as much as they are today. So these, these plants evolved needing and requiring more CO2 than we have. So the more CO2 we have, the faster they grow, the bigger they grow. Other things like uh, they, they can fight drought better with more CO2. Um, there, there's, a, there's more soil moisture because they're taking less soil out of the, or less water out of the soil. Uh, lots of benefits. We can see that crop growth and crops are by virtually every country around the world, from the coldest to the warmest, are benefiting uh, from modest warming. And just think about this. It's easy to think. If you're in Norway or Canada, if it's warming, it's warmed about a little less than a degree in one century. But that warming lengthens the growing seasons. So crops are uh, killing frost and earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. And so if you're if you're in Alberta or Saskatchewan, that wheat crop, you can grow you can plant it earlier and, and you can maybe get a couple harvests in. Uh, and then the CO2 is just turbocharging that with uh, CO2 fertilization effect, powering uh, plant growth. Now, as a Canadian, of course, I will not complain for an increase in temperature. But what about those who live in equatorial countries? Is there a drawback to even raising the temperature by one degree, as you said, in this past century? Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is, it's the subtropical regions around the equator that, get, that see the least amount of uh, greenhouse-driven warming. And it's the poles that get the most, where they really need it the most. And we see countries, we've got a research associate, Vijay Jayarash, who lives in southern India. Uh, he writes a lot about crops in India. And even a warm, really hot country like India, my Lord, there's just crop after crop after crop is just breaking records year after year. Uh, that's to be celebrated. And we should we should welcome that. We're, we're, because of modest warming and increased CO2, we're able to feed a much larger and growing population. Again, that's something that we should celebrate. So then why is CO2, uh, why has it become demonized by by climate change activists, why did they latch on to CO2 if there seemingly is no negative based on what you said? Well, because all of the fossil fuels, our economies, the Western economies, capitalism, it's based on uh, in a, inexpensive, abundant, reliable, affordable energy. And we get that from coal, oil, and natural gas, somewhat nuclear, but uh, it's these renewables that, that don't that are not reliable. That's the, the main drawback with renewables, wind and solar. Uh, they're not reliable. They're not abundant. And they're not affordable. If you look at the full cost from uh, of the life cycle of these renewable facilities, um, and you ask me why are they basically you're, what, what what your question is? Why are they lying to us? And I don't. You can't really. I can't look inside men's and women's souls to see what their motivations are. Uh, what I can do is say, okay, this is what they're telling you, and this is what the facts are. And as a scientist, that's my that's my role. Uh, and so I mean, we just heard it last week with Greta Thunberg uh, that didn't attend the COP conference. Uh, she said this isn't really about environmentalism. It's we need to get rid of the capitalist system and remake it. Uh, we just saw it over in uh, Egypt, Sharm El Sheikh at the big meeting that's going just concluded. Uh, they're talking about the same thing. John Kerry's talking about the Great Reset and how COVID, he actually stated that COVID gave us a great model that we should be using for climate uh, crises and climate control. 
we saw how easily people were manipulated uh, by using the COVID crisis to do this. And he came out and said, he put the words out there and actually stated that this is a great model that we should use for climate. Oh, wow. Um, and that for our viewers, John Kerry, um, uh, former Secretary of State, or is he still currently the Secretary of State? No, he's the, uh, what they call the climate envoy uh, for the United States. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is, uh, but it, it probably is not anything that's, that's beneficial to the economies uh, of the United States or Canada. Okay, well, we're going to pick up this discussion in just a few moments when we return. Stick around. Welcome back. We're discussing CO2 and climate change and joining is Gregory Whitestone. He's the executive director at the CO2 Coalition and a geologist with over 40 years of research experience. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, Gregory. Here in Canada, because we have such a large polar uh, landmass, if you will, many Canadians are concerned of what they hear in the media about the melting polar ice caps and, of course, the related rising sea levels. Is this a threat? Well, actually, we could melt the entire northern polar ice cap, and it would scarcely have any effect at all on sea level. And you're going, what? What is that? And that's because the, the northern polar ice cap is, is ice floating on the surface of the ocean. And when you do that, it, the, if you can imagine the Titanic, and again, 90% of an iceberg is submerged, um, and, and you can melt that. Uh, ice and really doesn't raise sea level. You can do that experiment at home with put ice in a glass and melt it. And when that ice melts, the, the level of the water remains the same. It is true that the, the glaciers, land-based glaciers as they melt, contribute uh, to global warming. But uh, in fact, I was just doing a chart yesterday on this. I was taking a look at uh, Glacier Bay in Southeast uh, Alaska, right up against Canada. Uh, that, that started, the ice there started to retreat in the late 1700s and really started retreating in the early 1800s. So we had, now bear in mind, we didn't start adding CO2 to the atmosphere in, uh, in any significant measure until the mid fifties, 1950 or so. But yet we had 200 plus years of, of retreating great glaciers prior to us adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So we had naturally driven glacial retreat and increased CO2 well before we started to add any, any, any CO2 to the atmosphere. So well, they'll tell you, well, that 200 years, that's natural, but that all changed in the middle of the 20th century. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. So then the why, why did they forces, melt? Why were they retreating rather? That's, that's a big question. Uh, we've got it. We see, we see that there are series and cycles of warming and cooling going back 5,000 years to the first great civilizations uh, we, we saw the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians wrote, uh, those great empires rose up during a previous warm period. Uh, and then there were other cycles of warming, the Roman warm period, the medieval warm period. And they were, each period was, was uh, separated by cooling and it was horrific. The cooling periods were associated with crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation, just opposite of what we're being told. The warming periods, history tells us, we should welcome the warmth and fear the cold, just opposite of what they're claiming. Uh, I think we need to look at what, what happened throughout his, history over the last 5,000 years, and that's what I do. Okay, well, now I'm scared to ask this question, but are we in a warming or a cooling period right now? Well, we're in a, it's, it looks like we're still in this warming trend. It started more than 300 years ago in the depths of what was called the Little Ice Age. So we've been warming in fits and starts uh, for more than 300 years. Uh, one of the interesting things was when we remember, I just said we started adding CO2 in the mid 20th century. Just as we started adding CO2, we went into a 30 plus year cooling trend. Well, how does that work? I thought CO2 was supposed to be the warming effect of the atmosphere, but then we had 30 years of, of, of cooling instead of warming. Uh, and, and since, since the, the late 1970s was the end of that cooling trend, it, it's warmed and it looks like it still is a little bit. Although since 2016, it's been, that's only six years, it's not a long time, but we, it's really been flat level of, of temperature globally since 2016. We had a, there was a big spike in 2016 and then it cooled down again. Uh, so yeah, we're in a warming trend and, and it may last for another 
50 or 80 or 100 years. I, I don't know. I like to look at the past warming trends to figure that out. Uh, it's tough to make. One of my favorite quotes is uh, from Yogi Berra. He said, it's really tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy to look back and see what happened, but what's going to happen in the future, it will eventually cool down again. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. And uh, when, when it's going to, going to occur, I don't know. Well, uh, I'm, when it does occur, it's going to be harmful to crop growth. Well, I'm nervous about that because we're entering our winter here, and I, I would loathe to have a very cold winter up here in Canada again. Uh, do you think we're in for some more extreme weather? Um, we only have 30 seconds to commercial. Yes, we are in for extreme weather, but that's we always have had extreme weather. The, the good news is extreme weather is not increasing. In fact, uh, MDAT database shows that there's been a 10% decrease in extreme natural disasters since the year 2000. We've seen a 98% decline in extreme weather-related deaths well, and that surprises, since the early 1900s. And I think that'll surprise a lot of viewers because we, we hear frequent media reports on the contrary. We're going to pick up this discussion in just a few moments. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our discussion on CO2 and climate change and all that entails. And joining me again is Gregory Wrightstone. Uh, Gregory, before commercial break, we were talking about extreme weather. And of course, that means droughts and hurricanes and, and flooding. We've seen a lot of flooding in Canada. Uh, does climate change factor in to extreme weather? Does, is, is, is that a thing? It, it is. But what's interesting, it could well be that a slight rise in temperature we know we've seen a decrease, a significant decrease in F3, F4, F5 tornadoes uh, in the United States. And as you're probably aware, the United States has the highest by far uh, number of tornadoes to hit uh, any other country. Uh, we've seen that uh, hurricanes. Now, NOAA here in the United States says use landfalling hurricanes. We can take that. We know every landfalling hurricane since probably the mid-1800s, since 1850. And if we look at that data, which I've done, uh, you see that landfalling hurricanes uh, have been in decline. And of course, we get landfalling hurricanes more so than Canada. And I looked at every state bordering the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard. I looked at every state, every single state except one, Mississippi, had a decline in the number of landfalling hurricanes on their state. Uh, so it just, it, it, flies in the face of, of what we're being told. It's contrary to what we're being told. Um, and again, I, we, we, they can paint a tail when there's a, a Hurricane Ian that makes landfall. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, I'm waiting. I, I have a home in Florida and I need a new roof because of Ian. But it wasn't because of climate change. Uh, hurricanes happen. Hurricanes have always happened. Uh, they're not, the good news is they're not more intense and they're not, make, they're not more of them. So... We hear about the Green New Deal and um, countries, including Canada, embracing green energy such as wind and solar. Is this a good path forward for the U.S. and Canada? Oh, absolutely not. It's, 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 they're making policy based on climate alarmism and, and climate falsehoods. We should make science, it should be science-based data, and that's what we provide here at the CO2 Coalition. We have some of the 100 plus top scientists and experts in the world that deal with this. Uh, we, we, just we just published a paper last week on nitrous oxide, N2O. It's the new demon molecule that they're, that they're and we need nitrous nitrogen-based fertilizers to grow food. We talked about photosynthesis, but we also need nitrogen in the soil to make them grow faster and bigger. Oh, uh, absolutely. And, this, and we just and, had and actually the former agricultural minister, Jerry Ritz, we did a full interview with him on uh, the potential fertilizer ban and limitations that could take effect and how that might very well decimate the farming industry here in Canada. And, and of course, raise up rates for or the prices for consumers and, of course, impact variety. Think about this. According to our new paper, again, this is the top physicists in the world who are working on this. Dr. Will Happer was the lead author. Uh, he looked, for one thing, nitrous oxide will not double for more than 400 years. It won't, it won't, it won't increase that much for 400 years. And when that does occur, it will only, the warming effect of that increase will only be six hundredths of a degree below our, our ability. Is that worth famine and probably starvation for people? No, not at all. Uh, they need to take a look at this clear eyed. Uh, we need to see the very huge benefits 
of, of nitrogen-based fertilizers and the virtually zero negative effects. And again, I, again we, can, we know throughout history, warming has always been beneficial. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a 600th of a degree temperature rise of Celsius uh, is, is it's, it's closer to zero than it is to anything else. So we only have about 45 seconds left, and I'm going to end with a, a very bombastic question, but is the world going to end? Will we succumb to this thermageddon, as you call it? Absolutely not. It's, it's ridiculous. Again, boy, just look at every metric. Just look at things. I mean, in life, I've got a chapter in my new book, Life is Good and Getting Better, and it just is. If they, then what they need to do is get, get the heck out of the way. Let let the entrepreneurs and energy companies go and develop the abundant natural resources we have here in North America. Okay. Well, Gregory, thank you so much for coming on again. And um, people want your book for more information to read through your charts. Where should they go? A lot of people get it on Amazon, uh, but you better go quick. I've only got seven left in my uh, uh, inventory. <laughs> we'll sell out probably in the next few days. Okay. So well, inconvenient facts. Okay. Inconvenient facts. Thank you so much, Gregory. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, fascinating discussion. We hear many times of the alarms concerning climate change, and it's always important to know your facts when covering an issue. And so this was definitely a very interesting discussion. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.